I'm uh, really happy to be here with you. It is early, but uh, I told my wife that I wanted Valentine's Day to last as long as possible. So here we go. Um, really happy to be with the group. Um, I've titled my talk, The Quest for the Holy Grail, and I do have some uh, disclaimers. Uh, so my first disclaimer is that I have worked for the Air Force and Intermountain my entire professional career. And neither of those organizations are, is big on me working for other people. So uh, I've spent nearly uh, 20 million taxpayer dollars now on injury prevention research and on ACL injury prevention. Um, and uh, I will do it again if I'm given a chance. I uh, am unrepentant and uh, I, I love uh, this stuff and I'd love the chance to talk with you about what where the state of the evidence is this morning. I wanted to start with just a quick case. Uh, this is Ellie, that's not her real name. Uh, some of us on the call will probably recognize who this is. She was an All-American high school soccer player. Super excited to have her at the Naval Academy. It was a very, very good uh, recruit for us and kind of at a pivotal time. Um, as a freshman, she had a right ACL tear that cut her season short, made it so she couldn't, uh, couldn't play. Um, as a sophomore, she had a left ACL tear after a bunch of rehab, came back for her ACL on the other side. Um, she rehabbed from that and got back and was excited to try to come, but rehab made me a little too hard. And as a junior, had a really bad uh, pelvic stress fracture that uh, kept her out of soccer. And then uh, she was uh, really excited for her senior year. As you may know, at the Naval Academy, there are no redshirt years. You just go with what you've got. and. Uh, uh, as a senior, she was excited to play. And I still remember being on the sideline there and uh, gosh, she probably wasn't more than uh, 10 yards from me when she took a pass and turned to go upfield. And we all heard a loud pop and it was a, a, a repeat right ACL tear um, that took her out again. And uh, she was one of eight ACL tears on our varsity women's soccer team that year. And um, that was what really got me started thinking about ACL injury and, and how we could maybe present, present some of these injuries. Life is about choices. Listen, you remember this, this lovely movie thing here, Indiana Jones. Got to choose wisely. So, you know, uh, if you're supposed to choose wisely with ACL prevention programs, right? Are, are these ACL prevention pro programs the holy grail, or are they just a, a dusty cup that are going to turn us all into, into dust and not a good choice? Um, so to talk about that this morning, I'd like to talk about, you know, what was jump ACL? Dr. Wilkins um, talked about that at the start. That's something that really got me started with ACL prevention. Um, and then the, We'll talk about, you know, do intervention exercises, does exercise really work? Can it prevent uh, ACL and other low shoulder injuries? Can we predict who's likely to suffer injury? Can, uh, can we look at people and say, you're high risk, you're not high risk? And then talk a little bit about the way forward and, and where we're going from here. So as we look at this, uh, probably going to talk about uh, the military, first of all, and why would you do um, uh, intervention study, why would you do uh, uh, ACL intervention in the military? Uh, musculoskeletal injury is the number one cause of lost duty in the military. It's, it's not illness, it's not uh, anything else, but it's musculoskeletal injury and mostly non-combat musculoskeletal injury. 34% of troops have deployed in uh, Operation uh, Iraqi Freedom had a non-combat musculoskeletal injury that limited their performance while they were there. That's a lot of people. Um, this accounts for a very large number of our medical aerovacs to fly people back uh, after being deployed. If you look at that, that's a quarter of the people we fly back are from these uh, non-combat musculoskeletal injuries, including ACL injury. ACL injury because of its extended rehab and because of uh, the nature of the injury requiring surgery. Uh, this is a major source of lost duty time, even if it's not perhaps the most prevalent of, uh, ACE, of musculoskeletal injuries. It is a major source of lost duty time just because it takes so long to recover. Um, if you look at the uh, Air Force, Army, and Naval Academies, uh, it's one of the few places on the face of the earth where the uh, ACL injury rate is exactly the same between men and women every year. 
Um, it still hovers at about 3% uh, ACL rate per year. That's about 110 ACL injuries at, at the three academies combined each year. Those come in a variety of settings, whether those are uh, more battlefield looking tactics, whether those are just uh, things that we do at the academies. So those all can cause injury. If you have an ACL injury, you lose nine months of limited time, uh, lost limited time. That's 90 man years that are lost annually. This is a very old slide. I have no idea how much an academy education costs now, but uh, we used to say it was $9 million a year that was lost just to ACL injuries in, uh, in time. And that's where we kind of came up with the jump ACL study. Uh, and so what was jump ACL for us? It was a prospective cohort of uh, looking at modifiable, modifiable risk factors for ACL injury. And our question was really this, what are those modifiable risk factors that predict ACL injury? And how do we get those better? So it was a five-year trial at three military academies. We were looking to enroll 500 people at each academy each year. We wanted the, uh, a lot of them to be female so that we oversampled females at the academy. Uh, we were looking for 6,000 people total and 15,000 man years to capture in a prospective fashion 100 uh, ACL injuries. What do we do? Obviously, informed consent and a baseline questionnaire. One thing that we proved, you prove things that sometimes you don't intend to um, when you're doing, uh, when, when you're doing uh, ACL injury prevention research, but you prove some things. And one thing we proved is that uh, cadets are super good at filling out bubble questionnaires. Uh, the IRB was sure that these guys wouldn't be able to handle our 13 page uh, injury questionnaire, and we didn't have any problems. They bubbled through those things like nobody's business. They're really good at filling out questionnaires at the service academies. Um, we did strength testing where we looked at their uh, strength of the lower extremity muscles. Um, we looked at navicular drop, Q angle, postural uh, stability and measures. And then of course we looked at the jump landing where we had people jump off a box to half their height uh, we had them rebound back up off the ground to simulate uh, uh, what ACL injury high risk movement mechanics could look like uh, as we looked at this with a 3D motion capture system. Um, what did we find? We were successful in uh, our numbers. We did capture prospectively uh, 5,800 subjects in this, uh, this four year study. Uh, we had almost 40% females. And we did capture 108 primary ACL injuries, uh, first time ACL injuries, with this prospective data be taken beforehand, and then people tearing the ACL while they're at the academy, where we could uh, have a look at them and see what had happened. So when we go back and look at what we found with jump ACL, um, we looked at uh, what, what showed up in the baseline questionnaire, what predicted, was it sports they had played, was it distance they had run, or was it menstrual cycle data for the females? Really wasn't any of that. What we really found was the most predictive questionnaire risk factor was a history of prior ACL injury. That shouldn't be surprising to anyone. That's, we've known that for a bit. Um, and uh, if you look at that, that uh, it's about a seven-fold injury risk. If you've torn your ACL before, had surgery, done rehab, been cleared to be at the, ACL, the uh, military academy, then you're sevenfold likely, uh, more likely than the guy next to you to have an ACL injury uh, just with that history. And uh, we know that's true for other things. We'll talk more about this later. Looking at strengths and, bi and biometrics that we did, was it was Q angle predictive, was hip extension, hip abduction strength. When we looked, we found that we, there were certainly differences between men and women. Men and women have different strength profiles, they have different uh, biomechanical alignment profiles. But there's no difference in posture alignment, no difference in strength between our injured subjects and our uninjured subjects. There were differences in strength and posture, uh, but those did not even predict jump landing movement pattern, mean that if you jump off the box and you someone looks at you and says, you did that pretty well, or if you jump off a box and we look at it and say, that was horrible, you look like a tool, um, that doesn't mean that you had good quad strength or bad quad strength. You jump off the box and land the way you're going to do it, uh, independent really of what your quad strength and your hip strength and your navicular drop would be. 
So those were good things to learn. Where we did see differences when it was in their jump landing biomechanics, uh, when we looked at those and figured out what those were, we found that uh, landing in more hip adduction with your hips more narrow was a four-fold increased risk for ACL injury. If you landed with your hips in, but your, but your knees kind of in a little bit of valgus movement, uh, this is how we'd best describe it, that also had a significantly increased risk of about threefold. And uh, those things were what were in a high risk movement profile. To be clear, this was a study of uh, prospective risk factors. No one tore their ACL during our testing for our original jump ACL study. Um, one thing that we did find was that uh, this was a pretty safe activity to jump people off boxes. Um, we ended up testing a, over, uh, in this study and other studies, we ended up testing the same shirt as you, Brio. 110,000 people um, over the Look course at our shirt. of the study. And uh, sorry, we've got somebody who's off mute there, but um, we're, uh, we ended up testing about 110,000 people. And it was about on our 110,000 person that we actually had someone tear their ACL jumping off a box. It was actually on a warm-up jump. And there was no cameras running. Nothing was nothing was happening, so we didn't get to capture that. Um, so you can jump a lot of people off the box and not get people who tear their ACL. Um, this was a study of prospective modifiable risk factors for ACL injury to identify people who are at higher risk and look at high-risk movement patterns and try to figure that sort of thing out. Um, some things there. Great. Okay, so this is what we would call our ACL scale of justice, right? You might use it to look at uh, rutabagas or something else like that, or way you rutabagas at the grocery store. Uh, we used it to try to figure out ACL injury risk. I'll use it as my model here. So if we look at this, we have some, uh, this is a measure of ACL strain, we're saying, right? Uh, this measure here. If we look at the ACL here, well, there are certain things that we do, the jump landing, studying, these are our task factors that might, might cause the ACL to experience strain. Um, we also have movement pattern factors, right? Things that we do. So you can do all these things, land, stop, and cut with a low risk movement pattern or with a high risk movement pattern. And uh, we looked at that with our study. If you do this with a low risk movement pattern and you do a jump or a stop or a cut, and you weigh what the ACL strain looks like, you find the ACL says, well, thank you. That's a very good level of strain for this purpose. I was uh, put here on the earth to protect your knee and I'm very happy to do that. If you do these things, these motions here with a high risk movement pattern with some of the things we talked about with poor trunk control, with increased ground reaction force, and you look at what the ACL strain is, you see that that's, this, alone does not cause ACL injury. There are people that jump and land like this all the time, and they don't tear their ACL every time they do that. What it takes really for ACL injury to happen is these unplanned risk factors. You get distracted, you get pushed, your defender moves at the last minute. But if you put a couple of those in on top of a high risk movement pattern with these motions, then you will uh, get your ACL straight into the red zone and have ACL failure and tear your ACL. Um, if you do instead those things with a low risk movement pattern, and then uh, you add on those unplanned risk factors and you weigh those in the ACL scale, uh, instead of getting to red, oftentimes you just get in the yellow zone and you, you're able to recover and, and continue to play. So this became evident to us as we looked at jump line and biomechanics that the goal really would be uh, that biomechanics play a key role in keeping our ACL safe and how can we get more people to go about jumping and stopping and cutting other, other ways with a low risk movement pattern instead of a high risk movement pattern? So this has been done lots in the civilian world as well. Uh, Tim Hewitt has spent a lot of time on medial knee displacement and trunk displacement. There are lots of other studies that looked at drop landing. Um, they had kind of some uh, different things. There were some studies that said there were no risk factors that predictive of primary ACL uh, injury, and that some there were only only predictive for repeat ACL injury. We'll talk about why this might be. Um, and then there are some that say that uh, only BMI is really predictive prospectively of uh, 
knee injury overall. Um, so our study in Jump ACL was successful in finding what the biomechanical risk factors might be prospectively for ACL injury. Uh, some other studies said that was true. Some other studies said that was false. But it really led all of us to the question of can we prevent injury through exercise programs? And uh, so that's the next thing yeah, the for us. To are, talk. Our next question it kind of was, reduces the amount of traffic you have when you go home. So that kind of helps. But yeah, 7 a.m.s are. Can are everyone rough. mute your phones? Yes. So our next question was can a 10 minute injury prevention program? Uh, prevent ACL injuries in military folks. And that was our next thing. We had a program that we designed. There are lots of programs out there, whether that's the, the, the 11, the 11 plus, it used to be the PEP program. We had one called the DIME. We thought it was clever that we called it the DIME, the Dynamic Injury uh, Modification Program, uh, Dynamic Injury Movement Enhancement Program. We thought ours was cool because it was 10 exercises and was designed to be 10 minutes long. Uh, we went up to the Military Academy of West Point to look at this uh, program, and our, our question was really, you know, do these programs work? Uh, some, some do not. If you look at where the data was, and still largely is, um, most of the recent studies, more recent studies, show that intervention programs work, but there are a lot of them that say that they don't work. What is true is that a lot of these programs are very long. They're often 20 minutes per session, three to five days a week. Um, and that's a long time. If you're an old guy like me trying to do an injury prevention program, that's my entire exercise session, right? I'm exhausted, worn out, ready to quit if that's my injury prevention program. Some programs have professional supervision uh, with athletic trainers, and some are amateur-led just by coaches or other people who may have very little training. Some are based by athletic clubs, some are team, some are uh, the Trail of Tears study. And as we look at injury prevention programs, this is a really good one to look at. Uh, with Michael was from BJSM in 2016. Um, this was uh, this was a coach-led study, and uh, I'm going to go back one. It was a coach-led study with Michael Bust, and what they were looking at was uh, Norwegian handball players. And so they went and they did an injury prevention program. This was about 20 minutes long, three to five days a week, and they put it in a Norwegian handball. And uh, they they just did it with the coaches. They they did they they the coaches in and said coaches you run this study and what they found was actually that when they did that with their coaches the first year the people who did the prevention study had more acl injuries than the people who uh, didn't do the injury prevention uh, study exercises uh, and the coaches didn't like doing it and they had to kind of evaluate their data and said oh my gosh we're actually hurting people with what we're doing here um, and so they had athletic trainers come in to the handball teams and they ran the injury prevention exercises the next year. And they found that the next year that the injury prevention exercises worked and they decreased the number of injuries. And uh, so they said, well, gosh, that's great. So they had the athletic trainers run it for a few years. They brought their coaches in and they trained them and they got them all uh, set on how to do the exercises and what to do. Then they gave it back to the coaches and sure enough, the coaches were able to they, the first year just kind of broke even, but by the second and third years of, of the repeat with the coaches being involved in the study, they were able to show into prevention. And finally, after 10 years, they were able to show a statistical, uh, statistical difference between people who did the injury exercise and those that didn't. So it's not guaranteed. I mean, even as far back as 2016, we're having people report uh, negative effects from an ACL injury prevention program. So it's uh, it's still a good question of could you do this in 10 minutes at a military academy? Again, we looked and we saw uh, a bunch of freshman cadets in the summer of 2010 and 2011 that looked at our program. They were block randomized by their military company to either do the regular army warm up or to do our dive injury prevention program. Uh, as many of you know, at uh, all the military academies, there's a basic training period from early July to mid August six weeks where uh, the new incoming freshmen uh, kind of have their basic uh, training. They're led by upper uh, classmen, these cadre, who uh, help shape these people up into, into soldiers, sailors, and airmen. Um, and uh, they use uh, time-inspired motivational techniques like yelling to do this and uh, some other things to help uh, get people going. 
So uh, we did our program during their mandatory warm up. Uh, before physical training, first thing in the morning, there is a mandatory warm up period where everyone on the field does that. And it's led by the cadre, uh, by the upperclassmen. And we had physical uh, education instructors supervise the cadre in uh, these upperclassmen and leading the intervention programs to people. So on paper, this looks like a very simple, very easy thing to do. You block randomize these people by company and uh, say, well, go off and, and do either the dime warm up or the army warm up. In actuality, it becomes very challenging. If you look at a map of West Point Military Academy and you overlay where physically all these people could be at any one time trying to do this, these exercises, they're scattered all over the base. They're scattered all over the woods. They're on all sorts of places. It's difficult to get to them to monitor this, whether people are doing this program or not. Um, and oh, by the way, this program happened from 0500 to 0515 every morning. So it made for very early mornings to get out there. Because of these constraints, instead of having just two groups, we ended up with three, right? We had people that did the Army warm up program. And then we had people that did our dime program that were just supervised by the cadre. Those cadre received two weeks of training in how to look at the exercise program and how to monitor exercises. Um, and they did have a physical education instructor helping them with that. Uh, and then we had people that were actually supervised by the cadre, but they had our researchers who were there um, and we were able to help them with that monitoring as well. So there were three groups in what we did. How did people do? Well, they actually did it. Uh, it's a nice thing about the military is if they say they're going to do it, they, they usually do it. They performed exercises 12 times over six weeks, so about two times a week, 10, time, 10 minutes each session. It was embedded in the Department of PE, so we had very high compliance. There was no evidence of crossover. We didn't have people looking at one's exercises and saying, well, I want to do what's, what they're doing over there. People really knew what their leader told them to do. But if we look at what that looked like, uh, if we looked at people uh, who had done the program here from July to August, and then we looked at their injuries from August to May, we found that low extremity injury, that people who had done the Army program had about a 16%. People who had done the, the dime alone had 17%. But people who had done um, the, our dime program supervised by our cadre, uh, our research uh, assistants, actually had a, a lower, on a 13%. Uh, rate of injury that was lower than what we expected in the general group. So we were able to look at this and say, well, that's a number needed to treat of about 34 to present to prevent a low stroke injury later in the school year by doing the dying program. So we thought that was pretty successful. We looked at knee sprains overall. We found some really interesting data that people had done the Army warm-up program had a 2% incidence of knee sprain over the, over their first year at the academy. Folks who had done the dying program had a 5% incidence of knee sprain over the time at the academies. And folks that had done our dime program supervised by our researchers uh, had a lower 1% uh, knee sprain rate. So uh, we had uh, mixed data when it came to knee sprains over the entire course of the study. So we yes, we had a number needed to treat here of about 70, but we also had a number needed to harm here, right? That we could actually hurt people with our intervention program if we weren't careful and had the cadre lead that without sufficient training. So our dime intervention program, like other programs in the literature, had mixed effects. It was effective if we had expert supervision. Um, knee sprains was the more significant outcome. All low extremity injury was a less significant outcome from an intervention program. And really, that's a fairly modest benefit. Why would we have a modest benefit? Like I said, not all intervention programs show benefit. This is not the easiest thing in the world to do. Our exposure was less than some other intervention programs. Uh, the frequency was low, two times a week versus three to five times a week. Our duration was lower, half of what you'd expect in other programs. And we really uh, only had this going for six weeks instead of to 12 to 25 weeks at other places in the literature. So it's a pretty modest dose of an intervention program that we were studying. Expert versus novice supervision. Most previous positive studies, and still, if you look at the data, most pre positive studies for injury prevention use an expert model. That's not possible or really cost effective when you're dealing with large groups of people in a military model. We were able to retrain our cadre 
to change a little bit about how we um, train them. And we found that as we ran this study through the years, that the uh, as cod, as we became more embedded and cadre became more used to us, we became part of the culture. That it, our numbers changed and did become effective uh, to have the cadre uh, lead the intervention exercises. But just like the Norwegian handball study, um, the first time having uh, non-expert supervisors, uh, it was actually detrimental to the group to have those exercises done. How did we compare with other studies that are out there? So we showed a, set, a number of 70 number needed to treat for knee sprain and 34 for low extremity injury, all told. Um, again, uh, that matches up pretty well with Sugimoto, who I think did the best work on saying, well, how do these programs work? Um, he showed a number needed to treat of 108 for a non-contact or 120 number needed to treat for any ACL injury. That's pretty close to 70, so we're in the right ballpark. And um, he said there wasn't a very good way to estimate uh, just for low extremity injury, just because that's a really hard thing to do. You can imagine an ACL injury is a pretty discrete time point, right? You either tear your ACL or you don't, but patellofemoral pain or even a meniscal tear, that's, that's a much more difficult thing to say really when that injury happens. So uh, I think we're in the right ballpark looking at some of the other data that's out there on what these things do. Clearly we're not the first study to report harm uh, you know, our number of needed to harm of 37. Uh, Soderman was another one who reported that he had harmed people with an ACL injury prevention uh, exercise type program. And we looked at Michael Bust and the, and the uh, Norwegian study before that definitely showed that early on like we did. So our DIME program, you have to be careful if you don't have expert supervision. Uh, it's costly. It's a high number needed to treat. And if, if you're going to prevent ACL injury, it's about 100 people that have to do the exercises for a season to prevent one ACL injury. And uh, we really need to make sure that our uh, that amateur leaders have really, really good training because you can hurt people. So um, the question is, you know, could we predict who's likely to suffer injury then so that we don't have to uh, give this to so many people because a number needed to treat of, of 100, that's that's a lot, right? Uh, that's a lot of people that have to do this just to prevent one ACL injury. So could we prevent who's likely to get this injury? Don't know if you guys have seen uh, Minority Report. Um, this is uh, one of my favorite movies because it really raises questions about should we be looking to the future and trying to predict the future and uh, arresting people before they they do a crime <laughs> uh, or should we not and should we should we really be looking and trying to figure out how who to uh, who to do screening on this is a very interesting uh, study uh, that looked at what it would cost uh, to enroll everyone in Australia in an injury prevention exercise program uh, I think that they way underestimated their costs I think they win as maybe the value, but it's just interesting to look at the numbers. So if we look here, this is what they said would uh, it would cost for if they enrolled everybody in Australia in an intervention exercise program between the ages of 12 and 25. That would take uh, 13 years, right? It would cost, they said, for the injury prevention program, would cost $53 per person. I think that's way low, um, but they were talking about a coach or an amateur led program to be sure. Um, it said that, uh, you know, that would cost uh, 693 million US dollars to do that, um, or it would cost 17 million uh, US dollars a year to do that for, for, for doing that. So um, that's a lot of money. So uh, this high cost per athlete per year, even if you estimate something very small, like $53 a year per participant, which I think is, is certainly quite low. Um, should we even try to find out who's high risk uh, or we just enroll everyone in the program? We could enroll everyone in the program, but it's a, it's a very high risk thing to do. Is secondary, uh, secondary prevention better than primary? Uh, I think it is. I'm still worried about this high number needed to treat. I'm actually a little bit worried that if we just go whole hog to intervention programs with that are led by amateurs, by coaches, that we, that we you know, some coaches are crazy. See that in kids' sports all the time. And uh, uh, I worry that they could go too far and they could actually hurt the kids. We've seen that in the literature. 
Um, so, and I don't, I don't believe that there are $17 million a year at ATCs just twiddling their thumbs in Australia. I know there aren't $17 million a year of ATCs just twiddling their thumbs in, Australia, in the US. We can't hire enough of these people in, in the mountain. They have a huge hiring crunch for ATC. So I'm just not sure how we would how we would enroll everyone in a prime range of prevention program. So I do think that um, that secondary age of prevention may be where we can agree that we must we might need to do something that uh, what would we do? How could we approach someone who's had an ACL injury and prevent them from having a further injury? So this is something that we actually did in our injury, in our ACL injury prevention uh, program in Jump ACL, and we can look at that. So again, the question of what's the biggest risk factor for future ACL injuries you can screen for? Well, it's uh, the answer is a history of previous ACL injury. So uh, looking at how we did Jump ACL, going back to the original study, we took six thousand cadets with no previous ACL injury and basically uh, followed them forward for four years to divide them into a never ACL injury group, right, of about 5,900 folks who never tore their ACL at the academy. But we had 100 of those folks who did, uh, they were kind enough to, <laughs> to tear their ACL for the first time at the academy, we did tear their ACL. The other thing we did, uh, we didn't tell the NIH about it, but we also enrolled 100 kids across the academies who came in with pre-existing ACL injury, right? And what the question was, you know, if we look at these three groups together, uh, are there differences in people who come in with an ACL injury uh, that would look like people who are going to tear their ACL injury? Do they have movement pattern differences, right? We know that they're, we can really match that. If you look at how this looks, so this is the hip interrotation data on landing from people who have never had an ACL injury. In red is people who are going to have that first ACL injury when they're at the academy. If you look at people who come into the academy with an ACL injury already, this is what they look like. They look down here. So you can see if this is good and this is not so good, then this is really not so good. Um, so uh, that was interesting to us. Um, if you look at what hip flexion angle looks like, again, good, to never tell your ACL, not so good for a first time ACL person that's going to happen at the academy. People who've had an ACL injury, they're already worse, right? They're already bad. And we saw this across many, many different biomechanical variables. So um, what we really didn't know was exactly what to do uh, with all of that. So uh, if you look at people who um, the distinct, we know that um, distinct movement patterns are prospective risk factors. We know that athletes who come in with previous ACL injury are very high risk for future ACL injury. We know from epidemiology that males tend to tear more commonly, they tear the same ACL. Females tend to tear the other side when they're going to have a repeat ACL injury. We know that athletes who have torn their ACLs have uh, similar or even higher risk movement patterns than people who are prospectively going to tear their ACL when you look back at the data. So a small list of what we don't know, right? Are those poor movement patterns the chicken or the egg, right? Those people who have already torn their ACL, did they just move worse to begin with? It's just the way God made them. And so they tore their ACL earlier uh, rather than later. And, you know, males with the same side ipsilateral and females with contra, why in the world would that be? Why, why does that happen, a repeat ACL injury? And then what would be the effect of an ACL injury prevention exercise program on these people? Would that reduce their risk of injury? Would it change movement patterns in someone who's already had an ACL injury and a surgical reconstruction, which one would that work? This was the work of Dr. Ben Gerger, and uh, Ben did his PhD with the jump ACL uh, study, and this was really a big part of his PhD, was to go back and to look at this, these groups and to look at uh, these folks, the folks who never tore their ACL, folks who tore their ACL for the first time at the academy and previously injured folks, and to follow them up uh, after four years and sort of say, put them through the retesting profile and say, what happened to their movement patterns while they're at the academies? What did four years at the academy do to their jump landing movement? And then looking at people who had torn their ACL already. So we looked at both injured and uninjured leg and, and what happened to people as we went through. What we found was that ACL injury caused, right? So when we went back and retested people here who had torn their ACL for the first time, ACL injury caused increased knee valgus and increased hip adduction, both on the injured and non-injured limb. 
If you look at those uh, biomechanical variables, those should look familiar to you. Those are the same ones that we said predicted ACL injury, but having an ACL, uh, ACL tear actually happen caused those things to happen to you. Your movement pattern in those ways got worse. You also had some decreases in your ability to use your quadriceps and use those quadriceps effectively to mitigate your ground reaction force in your injured limb only after tearing your ACL when we went back and did repeat testing. And this effect was much more pronounced in females than in males. They asymmetrically loaded if you were a female. It was very interesting to us that the only change that we observed in the control group, the people who never tore their ACL, over four years of academy training, their movement pattern was very, very stable. There was a tiny increase perhaps in the interrotation that sometimes reached statistical significance when you're looking at 5,900 people. That's a pretty easy statistical barrier to get over. So a small list of what we don't know, uh, right? Uh, so this thing here, our poor movement pattern is the, the chicken or the egg. Uh, the answer to that is probably both, right? Movement patterns play a role in why people tear their ACL, but we know for sure that when you tear your ACL, it doesn't matter if it's a contact injury or a non-contact injury, certainly um, uh, your movement patterns get worse when you tear your ACL. Um, they get worse in ways that predispose you to tear your ACL again uh, in both your injured and your uninjured legs. Why do males tear their one ACL more than they tear the females tear the other ACL on the contralateral side? Why is that? Well, that's here, right? Males tend to, everybody tends to get bad movement patterns. Males tend to lay, land symmetrically. So those bad movement patterns um, are distributed across both legs and probably affect a surgery reconstructed knee a little bit worse. So that's where they tend to tear. Females on the other end tend to put 70% of their landing force on their uninjured limb, right? They, they really protect and, and uh, embrace that injured limb uh, quite significantly. And when you put all that force and bad mechanics on an uninjured limb, it becomes an injured limb. And that's why that happens in quadriceps avoidance loading. So what would the effect of an injury prevention exercise program be on these people? Would it reduce the risk of re-injury? Would it change their movement patterns if they've already had an ACL injury? Unfortunately, we don't really know that, right? That's one that needs a huge cohort to, to look at that, and, and we, we don't have that. That's something that I'd like to do uh, now, is look at that across maybe the Intermountain system. We do know that getting an ACL injured athlete back to where you were before is a bad goal. If they have an ACL injury, then if they have to have a non-contact ACL, their biomechanics before were probably not great, right? So getting them back to that is not great. A better goal would be to change their injury prone movement patterns to ACL protective movement patterns. We often talk about, we're not gonna send you back until your legs are the same, until your movement pattern is symmetric. That's only good if it's a good quality movement pattern to begin with. If it's a bad movement quality pattern, and we see that in ACL injury, that both legs are symmetric, but they're symmetrically bad, then that's not a good thing, right? We have a good quality, and quadriceps loading and hip trunk control are key to having good mechanics. Uh, and I do think that movement retraining for people who've torn their ACL is just an important thing to do. As we come towards the end of my talking time, um, I wanted to look at some of the most recent data and some of the more um, interesting things that have come out of just the last couple of years that, that have shaped some of the ways that we continue to push forward here. There are some things not to forget, right? So as we look at this data, remember that to prevent one primary non-contact ACL, 108 female soccer players ages 14 to 17 have to do the prevention program, right? They have to do 20 minutes of work three times a week for a year. That's a lot to prevent one non-contact ACL injury. It's something we can't forget. Um, do you volunteer to lead this, right? Do you volunteer to go out? I don't wanna hang out with 14 and 15 year old female soccer players, 20 minutes a week for three times a week. I don't, I don't wanna do that uh, for a year. That's a lot of stuff to do, right? Secondary may be better. We know that intervention changes uh, can be helpful with that, but we have we have biomechanical data to, that suggests that that's possible. We don't have injury data, so that's still something we don't know. New things to think about, are ACL injuries going up? Or are they going down? Um, if injury prevention programs were going to work anywhere, they're going to work in Scandinavia. I don't know what it is about Scandinavian trials, but it seems like the Scandinavian trials always have positive effects, right? 
Um, so but if you look at the rate of ACLA constructions in, and this is from Finland, you look at their national registry from 2004 to 2018, uh, the rate of ACLA injury over that time went up. Uh, it looks like the rate went down a little bit in men from 2014 to 2018, but in women, the rate continues to increase uh, over that time frame. So ACL injuries are still happening, even in Scandinavia, despite all their emphasis on injury prevention programs, uh, where these are still happening, happening at a high rate. So this is still a problem. We still have things to do. Some things to think about are where you focus, right? Do you tell people to focus really specifically on the knee or on their global movement pattern? Right? Do you tell people to land light as a feather or focus on landing on the balls of your feet? What, what's, what's better to say that? We only have biomechanical data, but it does appear that uh, telling someone to focus on their sort of global overall movement pattern is the better thing, right? If you're trying to treat somebody. So there's biomechanical data to say that their movement patterns improve more quickly and they have uh, a better overall movement pattern. If you tell them to just land light as a feather, focus on their global overall movement rather than a specific cue that might be helpful. So that, that might matter as we look at that. Um, we have some people who, uh, this is really interesting, um, when we're looking at young athletes, right? We look at these young, young athletes, should we do traditional movements which talk about, you know, don't let your knees cave inwards, giving those specific things with traditional things, or do we look do a more simplified strategy of just get low? Uh, so they actually the randomized control title looked at this with three different groups of strategies, whereas coaches did their own warm up for control, no real, they could do jumping jacks, push ups, whatever they wanted, whereas researchers did uh, led simplified or traditional motion uh, improvement programs with younger kids. What they found was that if you look at just coaches doing things that that actually improves a little bit, their jump landing and post test, uh, but then it kind of comes back up as you uh, washes out of the system as you come back and look at the tension data. Um, if you do a simplified feedback program, that improves it more, but the uh, traditional program is what improves it the most. So what do I take away from these uh, these graphs here? How is it that a coach just doing jumping jacks or having people run on the field could improve your movement pattern in younger soccer players? Um, I think one thing that, uh, that we can say is that what little Johnny and Jane does when they get off the couch is not as important as that they get off the couch. Just moving kids will improve their, their movement patterns when they're uh, as young as uh, 11 years old. Simplified works, but not as well as traditional. And so we have to be wise. I think on the younger kids, we should really use something really simple. But as they get older, as they can understand more complex instructions, that's going to improve their movement pattern more. Um, so old diet, old ideas just won't die. If you look at grass versus turf, where are these injuries happening? This is something that just came out again. So we're looking at high school sports, uh, over a thousand ACL injuries that they're categorizing. Their takeaway is that uh, ACL injuries are more likely to occur on artificial turf, on natural grass. However, this was not, uh, was not significant for all sports. My takeaway was, yeah, your risk ratios are tiny, very, very small. Like all the risk ratios for grass versus turf were less than two. So you're looking at one point something risk ratios for sports. And, you know, that's just not going to do it for me. So this is not the holy grail. Uh, this, is, this is one that we should really kind of stop looking at grass versus turf and just uh, look at other things that are more likely to prevent injury than trying to change everything over to natural grass. So what is the way forward in conclusion? Uh, what are the things that, we're, that we take away? My conclusions would be these. ACL injury is common, but not that common. Right? Uh, it's not like these things happen at the drop of the hat all the time. At our current best, we could probably only prevent 50% of ACLs even with the world's best ACL intervention program. Sometimes that outside linebacker is just going to hit you in the knee just right, and you're going to tear your ACL. It's just going to happen no matter what you do. Primary ACL injury prevention, can we, can we use this as, a, as to prevent primary injury? I don't know. Um, if we combine it with other low extremity injuries that are, that are out there to prevent meniscus tears and prevent low extremity pain and maybe stress fractures, maybe primary prevention makes sense in high-risk populations that we could do it. But coaches are going to need to help us because of the cost, the high cost of hired athletic trainers to do all this stuff. And remember the Swedish handball study that 
Um, that can actually cause injuries rather than prevent injuries. And that also increases cost of these things. Unless someone has 17 million US dollars a year, Australia is gonna have to just keep selling tickets to the barrier reef because I don't think there's $17 million a year extra to do injury prevention exercises for everybody in Australia and certainly not for all high-risk people in the US. I think that um, secondary ACL prevention is where this where we need more work. We really need to come together and, and uh, put together our cohorts of ACL injured people and really look at what happens if we put them in a dedicated, uh, focused injury prevention program. Uh, would that uh, help us? We don't, certainly don't need, to, don't need to screen them to see if they're high risk. If you have any ACL injury, then you failed the screening test already. You, we know that you're high risk. We need a very large cohort to do that. The ethics of the control group, right? How in the world would you uh, enroll people and not do an intervention program in uh, people who already had an ACL injury? I'm not sure how we do that for sure. There's so many questions about the programs. How long should they be? What exercise should there be in each of them? Professional versus coach-led, how do we transition between the two? Do we need different programs, different cues, different leaders for younger athletes to make sure probably something is better than nothing? But remember, again, the Swedish handball studies and some of our studies that, that maybe not, right? You can really have a number needed to harm of these things. If you're changing movement patterns in people, you truly can hurt them if you're not careful. That's a list of my collaborators uh, with the Jump ACL study. I should have mentioned that Dr. Wilkins was one of our authors on Ben Gerger's work on repeat ACL injury at the academies. He's certainly been involved with this from the beginning. Uh, this takes a village of lots of people. We're grateful for the people that give us money and will accept more. This is one of my favorite ending slides that Fran might remember. Just a reminder, this is me as a sports medicine fellow. This is my first time looking at the Twin Towers. This was uh, August 9th of 2001. It was... Uh, uh, just almost a month later that the world changed forever. Uh, and uh, hopefully we can change the world forever with ACL injury prevention as well. Thanks very much. And I'm happy to take any questions. Anthony, as always, uh, that was an incredible amount of information and so well um, articulated. Um, uh, one question I have, and, and a lot of professional sports do this, they have a movement screening program and they take their athletes whether it be the combine or um or any team and they run their athletes through a screening uh, uh a movement pattern screening is there any value to that in identifying some muscle group that might help prevent an acl injury that's something that's been looked at a lot whether you're looking at the fms or whether you're looking at any one of the other uh batteries of functional tests to see if we can uh if we predict that um, and I would say largely those studies are inconclusive that um, certainly doesn't work over large populations that uh, how I jump land and move is how I jump land and move. And if you look at another athlete, somebody who's a really good athlete, say like Chad Holsipal, he's going to jump and land and move in different ways. And all those variables are very different. Um, I think it makes sense for the individual athlete to look at asymmetries. If you jump land and move or have different strengths, or different motion profiles, in your left side versus your right side, I think there might be some benefit in that to you as an athlete at correcting those things. You may find that position specific folks, if you're an offensive lineman, there may be something in the Y balance test that works better for you than if you're a running back. But over large populations, those screening programs have not been shown to be effective, have not been shown to predict people's risk. They weren't really designed for mass screening anyway. They were designed for individual athletes working with strength conditioning coaches to look at where they may need some, some work uh, or asymmetries in, in that individual person. So the answer, unfortunately, I think to your question, Dr. Wilkins, is no, those don't work as huge populations, but I think people still do them, hoping they could find something that might work for that individual. And the data on that is kind of a lot of bro science. It doesn't seem to pan out perfectly well with statistics, but people still do it. Anthony, sorry to monopolize all the questions, but you're up in ski country and skiing is a high risk sport for ACL injuries. Is there anything you can tell or train the skier to do to, to reduce the risk of ACL injury? Yeah, interesting thing. Um, so I think that uh, there, is, there is something that's really important to understand with skiing is that skiing, uh, tearing your ACL skiing happens with a large external rotation moment on the skis. And uh, that's the most common mechanism. It's different than a lot of other sports. 
um, in that it's, it's more, it seems to be a more rotational issue than, than a jump landing or other things like that that happens. So the, the one thing you can tell people to decrease the risk of injury with skiing is don't let them put your bindings on too tight. <laughs> it's much better that your ski fall off a little too much rather than that your uh, ski stay on and provide that extra rotation torque to your ski. So that has been uh, looked at and uh, that is a risk factor of having your bindings too tight for your skill level uh, is certainly something that will increase your risk of ACL injury when you're skiing. So if you come to Utah, this is a great year to come, by the way. We have so much snow. Oh, my goodness. It's a great year. But uh, don't let them tighten your skis very, very tight, if, uh, especially if you're not super used to our Utah powder. If there's no more questions, Anthony, I think we're gonna set you free. You can maybe cook your wife breakfast and bring it to her in bed. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here with you. It's still 5.30 for me. So I think I'm gonna get some work done and I won't wake my wife up, wife up till about 6.30. But thanks Dr. Wilkins and thanks to the group there. It's uh, awesome. Hello, Quan. it's good to see you too. Uh, and uh, we'll look forward to hopefully Next time I can actually arrange to come out and be on the East Coast if we're going to do this again. But it's uh, awful nice to be with you all this morning. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Dr. Wilkins. Thank you, Dr. Bueller. See you all later.